Hey, Retcon Raider here. Today's video is dedicated to the Raiders, the fine folks who help make these videos possible. With special thanks to Revenant, a nerd in more paint, Antonio Hernandez, Dragon Matrix 7, Excelsior, Lima, Nathan Welch Jr., and Valenrook. Thanks for your support, guys. That said, let's get started. And welcome back to the Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous Beta. As we more or less pick up right where we left off last time. Um, as you can see, I was obviously trying to set us up to ambush these guys, but I inadvertently stumbled a bit too close, so uh, I guess we're jumping right into it. We've got a few extra buffs in play, but otherwise our strategy here is pretty straightforward. We have our range fighters and fast attackers moving up along the side to take out those archers, and the sword and borders will be marching right up the middle to distract the zombos and draw fire. Well, I was hoping for a stronger start than that, but I can work with that. I was also hoping we'd be able to charge up those stairs, but the positioning is just too awkward. Okay, Sela and Creed are hanging back. They're just waiting for the Zombos. Oh, shoot. Yeah, I really should have seen that coming. Uh, we'll move her up to Sosil. He'll start healing next round. Almost. Nice. That is working as intended. Well, Jeff. Very nice. All right, let's slap down some healing. Where do you think you're going? The light take you. Continue fighting everyone. Um, that's fine. That is well within the scope of expected casualties. Sorry, Amber. The important thing is she is not dead like Sosail was. Hang in there, Kaiser. <laughs> 
one zombie lord in our way. Yeah, we have to keep moving. Fantastic. Halfway there. We need to get someone on those other archers. Keep them distracted. You won't survive me. Ow. <laughs> Moving up. Just out of charge range, of course. Okay, okay, stop shooting the cat, please. I think we'll start pulling our softer targets back. Fall! Lovely. Smilo down! Smilo down! Let's get Ember back up. Have her and Socio fall back to a safe distance. Up and at him, sweetheart. Why? Oh, right, because standing up is a movement action. Okay, I think we're good. The inheritor, guide my blade. Oh, and there we go. Man, after steamrolling our way through those first several fights, um that was a refreshing but unexpected change of pace. Let's go ahead and get our guys topped, and then we will push on through that ominous gate. And one more for Kaiser. Really? Those guys were one of the deadliest threats we faced thus far. 
and they were just rocking normal trash gear. <laughs> okay, I think we're good. Prepare to enter the scary door. Don't you dare! Get away from them! Um, Socio? Buddy, this seems like a really bad idea. Who are you? What do you want? All you have to do is die in the name of Baphomet. Have faith! You can do it! What an oddly inspiring death threat. Oh yeah, so Sosil's obviously not in a great spot right now. We'll need to push up quick before those archers decide to pincushion him. Let's drop the caster. That'll do. Thank you, Lan. Smilo's coming through. Lovely. Okay, let's try this. Huh, okay. Well, the damage was just about as disappointing as I expected it to be, but he did drop someone, so fair enough. And the way is clear. Yeah, land works best against targets that scream and bleed. Make of that what you will. Oh, I didn't think that would actually drop it. Also note, uh, we did manage to bump up Sociel's AC slightly. He's currently wearing the scale nail we found back in the shield maze. Plus two insight versus undead. Still not much, but thankfully it does seem to have gotten the job done. Huzzah! Hmm. 
Let's just ease you back a little. Ooh. Let's not have that. Make every strike count. I can see they're trying to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. They don't have to kill all of us. They just have to take down Sosil. Hmm. Okay, okay, sorry. Just had to be sure. Different additions, different DRs. We're fine. Sure, why not? Thank you, Wall Jeff. I surrender. Stop. I give up. Don't hit me. The young man in black robes throws his hands up in a dramatic gesture. You damn brat! How dare you! Suddenly, Sosiel becomes a totally different person. The artist's delicate hands clench into fists, while his voice comes out as a menacing roar. He leaps at the necromancer and breaks his nose with a single blow. You scumbag! I remember you! You came to our temple begging for healing just a month ago! We fed you. We shared our table with you and took you in. Then you... you... I'll... I don't even know what I'm going to do to you. Stop it. I surrender. You're... Sosiel ignores the necromancer's cries of pain, punching him right in the teeth. The necromancer spits blood but continues, fighting past the wild blows to his increasingly bruised and busted face. You're a priest of Shaylin. I've surrendered, so you have to spare my life. Your goddess demands it! Do you two know each other? We do. That's Nardi, a tailor's apprentice from Canabris. We healed him after he was mauled by a dog. Then he became a frequent visitor to our temple. He listened attentively to our sermons, studied the goddess's teachings, and praised our art. Sosio grits his teeth. Were you lying to our faces the whole time? When we took you in? When you sat at our table? When we broke bread with you? Were you planning to stab us in the back even then? The whole time. Now you understand part of it. Let's dig into the rest. The cultist curves his bloody lips into an evil sneer. I was hoping to lure you to our side. It wouldn't have been hard. We are everywhere, even inside you. I think you know it, too. You are not like all those pious devotees. You pretended to be, and maybe you fooled yourself, but we both see who you really are. You have that same demonic rage inside you. It's a pity I never had time to kindle it into a devouring flame. But sometimes you have to resort to a backup plan. Having you die at the hands of your dead friends was such a good idea. It's a pity it didn't work. Shut up! Sosiel swings his fist, but stops it in midair. His clenched fist trembles as he stares at the cultist with an expression of pure hatred. <laughs> you want to kill me right now, don't you? But you can't. You're a good boy, Sosio. So loyal to your goddess. You'll have to let me go or commit a sin, so I win either way. Witness the genius of our Lord Baphomet! Ha ha ha! Is he, uh, telling the truth? 
Your religion doesn't let you kill him? Yes, the Eternal Rose is known for her grace. She teaches us to show mercy to anyone who asks for it. It's one thing to slay an enemy in battle, but a captive. You must try to save their soul, to show them the beauty of the world, persuade them to abandon the path of evil. It's difficult, but the world is better for it. I'm just repeating your own sermons back to you. Come on, Socio, try to make me repent my sins. Perhaps your kind words will make me abandon Baphomet's teachings, run to Shaylin for redemption, and start knitting some masterpieces of my own. The cultist smirks impudently. Do you really believe that even this scum deserves a chance at redemption? I... I don't know. May Shaylin forgive me, but I have never had to struggle with this burden before. He looks at the cultist with visible disgust. I had no time to try healing the souls of villains. I was always preoccupied with healing the bodies of those hurt by them. The cleric looks up at the sky. Forgive me, Eternal Rose. You teach us to be merciful to our enemies and love them. But I... I am too weak, I'm afraid. Grant me absolution from this sin, for this kind of love is beyond me. Oh man, that is interesting. So much like with Sila and Darren and some of the other companions, it definitely looks like they're setting Sociol up to, uh, to have a future eventual struggle between two opposing alignments. Though in his case, it looks like they're setting up between his faith in Shaylin, so I guess neutral good, versus uh, just giving in to his rage and punishing the people he feels deserve to be punished, which would be much more um, chaotic evil. I imagine that will hinge largely around whatever's happened to his brother and how the player ultimately ends up handling it. But um, that is definitely a fascinating story arc. And it does make me want to use him a little more. Though, again, uh, Darren's my boy, so it's hard to choose between the two. It does make me curious, though, how that would interact with various mythic paths, especially the demonic path. Stop, Socio. It's not worth breaking your goddess's vows because of filth like him. Socio looks at the battered necromancer's face, then at his bloodied hands in disgust. He slowly lowers and unclenches his fists. Thank you for stopping me. I almost broke my vows because of this... this... I had absolutely no idea there was so much rage in me. I... It's a shame, a disgrace, but I must admit that I enjoyed beating him. Forgive me for letting you see me like this. It should never have happened. Socio wipes the necromancer's blood off his knuckles and steps away from him. You are the commander, and he is your captive. It's up to you to decide his fate. I surrender. Here, take everything I've got. Just don't kill me. The cultist turns out his pockets. Interesting. Yeah, I imagine this is a very formative decision. What do you think I should do to him? Sosiel stares at the cultist, then through clenched teeth utters, I have no right to decide whether he should live or die. You are in charge here. Right, right. So yeah, I think it is safe to say that this would definitely impact Sosiel's future development, because it's pretty clear that he wants us to punish the cultist for him, essentially letting him kill the cultist by proxy for what he's done. And to be fair, this guy uh, is pretty much your textbook example of an unrepentant villain. Um, if it was just up to us and Sosial wasn't tangled up in it, I would certainly, I would almost certainly strike him down, but we've got to keep Sosial in mind here, so... 
I'll send a messenger with orders to imprison the cultist. His deeds will be punished to the fullest extent of the law. Yes, that's the right thing to do. The cleric lets out a sigh of relief. Thank you. Yep, that's what I thought. So if we had gone through with it, I'm sure he would have, uh... He would have shrugged it off, but then he would have ended up hating himself for essentially indulging in punishing the cultist by proxy by pushing it onto us, which I imagine would end up coming back into play later if we were ever faced with a similar situation, one where he once again had to decide between sparing or killing someone who had wronged him. Someone who uh, may have done something to his brother, for example. Sociel examines the devastated graveyard, then diverts his attention to the terrified townsfolk. It's all right. You're safe now. We should bury the bodies again. This is a place of peace, and we must not leave it desecrated like this. The townsfolk are clearly terrified of even looking at the fallen undead, but Sociel's soft words reassure them. As they work together, the graveyard soon regains its tranquil appearance. After a prayer, Sociel bows his head before the graves of his friends for the last time. May the Eternal Rose grant them peace at last. Let's be on our way. We have many more innocents to protect from the horrors of this war. Hmm. Intriguing. Very intriguing. Good luck out there. Thrash some fiends for us. <laughs> Will do, ma'am. How horrible. I'll never sleep again. Dead people will forever haunt my dreams. Yeah, that's gotta be rough. All right, so let's go grab the last of that loot. And then we'll uh, have a quick poke around, make sure we're not missing anything. And we'll head back to camp. I figure we've got enough time for one good conversation. Oh, I see. Okay, so we could have used that to circumvent the front guard. Um, which would have made things easier, but obviously would have also deprived us of loot and XP. Oh, and speaking of depriving us of loot, it would appear that the majority of the corpses we just slaughtered are now gone, which I guess makes sense because we just buried them. And as we established last time, it is Canabra's custom to bury people with masterwork weapons and armor, if at all possible. You know, just in case someone ever decides to raise them, as happens from time to time. Also, yeah, I think it's pretty safe to say this was an alternate route that would have allowed us to ambush the Necromancer. But honestly, looking at it now, I'm not sure that would have been better for us. Um, ignoring the skill checks, which are hit or miss. That stairway really would have made the approach awkward. We would have uh, had to spend at least two turns getting down it. Not to mention it would have been a perfect choke point Thanks, for the Lamb. zombies. So awesome, they would have just Lamb. flooded it and delayed us even further while the archers picked us to pieces. Um, guys? Okay, um, also it would appear that this particular terrain has some issues, so probably best we did not go that way. Ah, but we still made it out, so that's good. Anyway, I think we are pretty much done here. Let's head back to camp. We'll have a quick follow-up with Socio and, uh... Then we'll round things out with a queen. Hmm. 
Maybe we'll luck out and have a quick random encounter. Nope, guess not. All right, let's go have a chat with Sosiel. I know we still have some other folks we have to talk to as well. I'll have to make a list off screen. Oh, well, uh, right, okay. I suppose our conversation with Sosiel in the graveyard would have actually been our follow-up. Well, that does keep things simple. That's fine. I'm not really sure how long it'll take us to uh, chat with the queen anyway. I'm actually not even sure where she is because my test game was with a lich character and he did not invite her along. So where is she? I guess we could talk to someone else. Aha! Uh -huh. Queen Galfrey nods to you cordially. Her armor is plain and unadorned. As promised, I entered the ranks incognito, along with a few bodyguards. I have introduced myself as Kitrain, an old friend of yours. I am a knight of a minor order, the Green Crows. We shall see how long it takes Anivia to sniff me out. The Queen chuckles. So, why did you uh, decide to join the Crusade after all? Because I have a curious mind, and I am quite unable to sit and do nothing for long. The Queen smiles, but then grows serious. You ask a difficult question. I must remain as safe as possible. My death or abduction would sow chaos among our forces. However, I am not only a queen. I am also a paladin of Iomidae. It is not in my nature to sit in a palace with my sword sheathed. In a manner of speaking, your request was simply a convenient excuse for me to be where I belong, crusading against the demon hordes. Besides, I am curious to see my new knight commander in action the savior of Canabras, and the heir of my fallen ally. I have a question for you as well. Why did you wish me to join you on the crusade? Hmm. I should note that uh, Queen Galfrey is one of the romance paths available in the game, and obviously this is the easiest way to start that path. But, as with the others, we'll try to avoid it. Um, no need to make this awkward. That aside, none of those paths really get a payoff in the current build anyway, so... Best to just avoid it for now. I'm glad to have the glorious Crusader Queen at my side. No, wait. Uh, this one seems better. Your presence will boost the soldier's morale. A reasonable expectation. And I like that you think of your warriors first. Noted. May I ask you a personal question? I've learned so much about Queen Galfrey from Chronicles and Legends. But what about the other Queen Galfrey? The one that the historians and bards cannot see? The Queen smiles faintly. That Galfrey is an old woman, weighed down by a great burden... But she has not lost her passion, and she will make the feathers fly when the time comes. <laughs> um, wow, all of these responses are really awkward. Uh, Mendev is lucky to have such a queen, and I am twice as lucky, for she agreed to go and fight by my side. Galfrey arches her eyebrow. 
I wonder why you say, agreed to go and fight by my side, but I hear, agreed to go on a date with me. Okay, look, I, I worked with what I had. It was either that or compliment you on your perkiness. So you gotta give me a break here. Do you really think that you are the first person who tries to charm me with words like that? No, you are not. If you want to impress me, you should do better than that. And now it's awkward. Thank you, Queen Galfrey. On the bright side, uh, I explicitly said we are not going for a romance path, so that doesn't hurt my feelings. Much. So how's it feel to be a hundred years old? It's funny. I can easily imagine a rock asking the same thing to a bush that survived one spring longer than expected. Don't get me wrong, it's just that your people emanate this steadfastness of stone. Besides, you live much longer than us humans. For Oreads, a hundred years is the age of youth, I know. As for your question... I really like the fact that they uh, worked in a bit of reactivity to our race. The reminders that we're playing a, an Ironborn Oread are few and far between, but it is a nice touch. I shall answer thus. The decision to prolong my life was not mine. It was the decision of the Church of Iomidae. The Sun Orchid Elixirs have been paid for by the Church. The priests determined that I was needed in these dark times, both as a ruler and a chosen paladin of Iomidae. I accepted their decision, and the great responsibility it entails. Kind of like how you uh, entrusted me with Darren? The Queen smiles. I saw such a wonderful opportunity to teach the Count a lesson, and just couldn't resist. Honestly, I expected you to dismiss him forthwith. The Count would have been forced to return to court a laughingstock. It would have been a truly sobering experience. There is nothing more disgraceful for a Mendevian nobleman than to be discharged like that. Darren Arende. The Queen shakes her head. He was such a lovely child. His mother, Lady Selena, was one of the most gracious people I have ever met. She was amiable, yet decorous, and truly kind. Bonds of kinship among the nobility are on the whole highly impractical and only useful for forming alliances, but Countess Arende managed to become a true member of my family. I suppose that is why I spent so much time believing her son to be a better person than he actually was. His company is a heavy burden. Still, I must admit that I am quite pleased that you decided to keep him on as a companion. There is a small chance that once he has had a true taste of the crusade life, the Count will finally cease to mock the Crusaders, as cynically as he is wont to do. Yeah, I would not hold my breath on that. I feel like um, trying to force him to be part of the Crusades to make him more sympathetic to the Crusades is the exact wrong way to go about it. But, I suppose stranger things have happened. This is the world wound, after all. Not that I'm complaining, but uh, you've given an army and the title of Knight Commander to a stranger. Why? Because for a hundred years I have protected my lands, trying to drive the Demon Horde back into the Abyss. I have tried every right and rational method. The Queen affords herself a brief, grim smirk. My armies have been led by the greatest generals, even Iomidae's angels. My goddess's herald created the wardstones for us. We have tasted victory more than once, but we have failed to close the world wound. As for you, do not call yourself a stranger. You are the savior of Canabras. Hundreds of its people saw the power that descended upon you and turned the demons to dust. It's the sign they've awaited for decades, a sign for all loyal hearts and followers of Iomidae. The time has come. Hope has been rekindled in the hearts of my subjects, thanks to you. Hope is a priceless resource. I had no choice but to give it wings. Hmm. You call it the sign they've been waiting for, but I take it you are reserving judgment? 
Her question seems to catch the queen off balance. A strange spark flashes in her eyes. When Eridan perished and Iomide took over his legacy, I was among the first to serve the new goddess. I helped restore her church from the ashes left by the chaos after Eridan's death. Since then, I have served the inheritor loyally and truthfully. I like to believe that I have earned the blessings of my goddess. The queen's voice is surprisingly ardent. Here we go. After I learned of what happened in Canabras, when I met you in the Defender's Heart, I had so many questions. Is it true that what happened was Iomide's work? Why did she give this power to someone unknown, rather than one of her most loyal followers? Could it be that my faith has grown weak, and I don't recognize the deeds of my goddess, even when they are happening right in front of me? Is the goddess somehow testing me? Those doubts were like poison. Huh. But I refuse to let them poison me, the queen finishes strongly. I gave you an army, declared you knight commander, and accepted you as I would anyone chosen by the goddess. Intriguing. I'm not sure I caught everything there. I'll have to go back through it in my spare time, but... My initial takeaway is that that actually neatly dispels the concerns that uh, some of the other NPCs have expressed to us, uh, to a certain extent. Characters like uh, Prelate Halrun and uh, Alan, Sila's friend, have expressed concerns that, that Queen Galfrey is suddenly acting so irrationally, entrusting such a vast amount of responsibility to an unproven quantity like us, and making general decisions that fly in the face of crusade tradition. But that's because, as she explains here, she has been here for every single crusade. She is seeing the, the greater picture, whereas they're only seeing limited slices. So in her eyes, she's already tried everything that she thinks should have worked, all of the things that tradition and common sense dictated, and none of them did work. Hence why she is now resorting to something that is so radically non-traditional, entrusting the fate of the entire crusade to a single person who may or may not actually be blessed by Iomide. That is a pretty big question mark right now. Don't forget, here I am Katrain the Knight. Noted. I wonder if that'll actually be relevant later, like uh, if we accidentally call her by the wrong name or something, we'll inadvertently expose who she really is. A surprisingly intriguing conversation. I've never actually gotten to enjoy that one before. Like I said, my uh, my test characters, plural, were a demon and a lich, respectively, so I've never invited her along because um, having her, I assume, would prevent you from pursuing certain paths or making certain decisions. She does actually provide some very intriguing insight into exactly why she made the decisions she made. I, I appreciate that. Anyway, um, we do need to talk to Nura, but there's actually something I want to grab out of storage before we do. So let's go have a quick chat with Anivia instead. You have got to be kidding me. A wounded elf, huh? Well, there were lots of wounded in Canabras. Who wounded him? In what way? Anivia appears relaxed, even carefree, but her eyes gleam attentively, and her hands, as if by coincidence, are resting on her belt next to her weapon. How should I know? Must have been the demons. If the wound was serious, I doubt he fully recovered from it. Maybe if you could point me toward a healer, I could... The woman, wrapped in rags all the way up to her eyes, turns around at the sound of your footsteps. Damn it! In a lightning-fast motion, Anivia hits the woman's hands, knocking out an amulet that appeared seemingly out of nowhere. It falls to the ground and disappears in an arcane flash. What's the rush, sweetheart? Stay a while. The commander and I, we've got a couple of questions for you, too. Anivia, who's this with you? Looks like a spy to me. 
not my first time seeing her in the camp. Just snoops around, asks the soldiers this and that. And if you try to tail her, she just darts behind a tent, and then she's nowhere to be seen. I've been hanging around here for hours, looking all bored, waiting for her to bite. And she did. Started asking her questions, and then you came by, right on cue. With an unnerving smile, Nanevia stares the grimly silent woman straight in the eye. All right, we're going to make you talk now, toots. Who do you work for? What did she ask you about? Looking for some elf. Tall, not Mandevian. Got wounded in Canabras. No idea who it might be. Don't have anyone like that in the ranks. Nanevia maintains an impenetrable expression. So, it looks like you won't be escaping this time. Who are you, and why are you hiding your face? You hear a heavy sigh coming from under the shawl. Fine, you've got me. We'll talk, but not here. Lead me somewhere away from prying eyes. Go ahead, Commander. I caught her, I passed her over to you, and now, as they say, I wash my hands of this whole ordeal. Anivia, you are terrible at your job. I caught this potential assassin. She's all yours. Bye. Well, if I turn up dead in a ditch, I think we can all agree it's mostly Anivia's fault. What do you want from me, soldier? Why are we out here? Is this your idea of away from prying eyes? But you know what? I don't mind having Lan watching my back, so... Let us proceed. In an exasperated gesture, she rips the half-mask off her face, and you see her black skin and crimson eyes. It's Kalesa, the elf you met in Canabras. What? What a shocking twist. I did not see that coming. Okay, so uh, one more time. Who are you? Giving you a scrutinizing look, she says harshly, there's no point in you knowing, soldier. Trust me, the answer would only bring you misfortune. And it still wouldn't be of any use to you. I'm a wanderer you won't ever meet again. Uh-huh. And uh, why do you keep following my army? To find someone. Kalesa lets out a resigned huff. His masters want me dead, which means I will die sooner or later. After a pause, she furrows her brow determined. But that doesn't mean I'll lie down and accept my fate. I'm no sheep waiting to be led to the slaughter, so I won't be waiting for a kindly executioner to come for me, knife in hand. Never again. Are you a spy? Her scarlet eyes flash rebelliously, and she mutters through her teeth. I'm not going to hide it. I have come here to commit a violent and bloody act. But I do not serve the demons, and I won't do you or your forces any harm. Oh, well, okay then. No, I'm, I'm going to need more than that. Why? Frowning skeptically, she gives you an appraising look. And what will you do with my story? Take it into account and pass your judgment? Kill me if you deem me a reprobate? Help the poor girl if you don't? Well, I haven't asked for your help, and your right to judge me seems rather dubious. She's clearly lying to you, but it doesn't feel like the guile of someone who is plotting a crime. There's a barely noticeable, hounded look to her eyes that makes her seem more like prey than hunter. All right, fair enough, I guess considering my only other option is to murder you on the spot. I will say, though, that uh, based on the current story beats, I do fully suspect that Forn is the real villain of this story. I mean, obviously, Kaelas is probably not a great person either, but this does seem like it almost certainly ties into that whole grand drow conspiracy adventure path. She shrugs casually, as if it weren't her fate that was being decided a moment ago. How nice of you, soldier. Why do you keep calling me soldier? She shrugs. Everyone's a soldier in a war, 
generals and privates alike. I look at you, and I see one for whom war is life. That makes you a soldier. You know what? That is fair. I was literally forged for war. Creed Ironfang's sole purpose in this story is to commandeer the Fifth Crusade. You're a drow, aren't you? She flinches and looks at you with undisguised sorrow. You have a keen eye for these things, don't you, soldier? You guessed correctly. I am a drow. But don't think that gives you the right to judge me. There is much you don't know about me. And you will never know. Believe me, it's for your own good. Well, I guess we'll have to leave it at that, because once again, my only options are to accept it or or kill you on the spot. The options for this quest definitely feel a lot more binary than they are with most of the others. But to be fair, this quest was just added in this build, so it likely hasn't gone through the same editorial process that a lot of the other ones have. With that in mind, um, yeah, I think it's pretty safe to say that Forn is almost certainly not necessarily the villain of this story, but definitely an assassin for hire, working for the, uh, the mysterious elven shadow government. While I'm not privy to all of the minutia, since I don't actually own that adventure path, my general understanding is that um, while the original drow were created during the Earthfall event, uh, which the storyteller just recently told us about, it is still possible for modern elves in the current setting to transmute into drow spontaneously if they perform suitably heinous and evil actions, which I suspect is the case with Kalesa here, which, again, doesn't really paint her in the best light. But um, the important takeaway is that apparently there's a subset of the elven government that wants to keep that a secret and is willing to kill anyone who finds out about it just to keep it a secret. So I imagine at some point Foreign will actually come after us as well because we now are essentially privy to the entire thing. Yes, our mysterious death would certainly be a grievous blow to the Fifth Crusade, but if anything, I think it's pretty well established that the Elven Empires and Pathfinder are kind of jerks. <laughs> Sorry, I had to uh, I had to find a term that wouldn't get me demonetized. But yeah, suffice to say, uh, it's pretty well established in both Kingmaker and Wrath now that the elves in the Pathfinder setting don't really care for the other races or um, the other cultures in general. I mean, uh, there are obviously exceptions, hence the storyteller's frustration about how his people were abandoned in Galerion rather than trying to uh, help mitigate the impending disaster. But by and large, they are generally very self-obsessed and arrogant. Very uh, stereotypically elfish. Anyway, that was interesting. Two conversations I've never really gotten to explore before. It makes for some uh, very intriguing food for thought. Uh, that said... We, ooh, we are coming up on the hour mark here, so yeah, I think this is a good break point. We'll hit the pause button for now. I will uh, take care of our off-screen bookkeeping and make a short checklist of the last couple of conversations we still need to have. Uh, Nura and Anivia right at the top. And we'll pick up here next time. I think we're just about ready to get this crusade on the road. See you then. Oh, and remember, although I do love playing Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous, you can find out more about the game by visiting the official website, the official social media feeds, or the official store pages. And if you'd like to help support the channel, then feel free to push the buttons that do the things, or maybe even check out the Patreon. Links are in the description. Thanks, Len. 
You're so awesome, Lan.